it, when people talk about the energy transition, especially if they're in the industry, I, I kind of lean in. It's like, great, you're talking about transitioning these last three and a half billion people out of energy poverty, you know, into prosperity by getting them access to things like propane. I mean, you, just be transformational for someone's life, especially in Africa. People in South America still will walk around one hour a day to collect animal dung and wood to heat up water that they've spent hours a day walking to collect to make that water somewhat potable. And if you could get them a just a propane burner to improve the air quality and what the dwelling that they're living in uh, would be just transformational. My name is Mike Maselli, and this is the Energy Show with REI Energy, where we're energizing your investments and maximizing your tax deductions. Today, we're going to be talking about raising our energy IQ, and you're going to discover how Americans and people around the world have no clue about the realities of energy and what we can do to increase our energy IQ. My guest today is Jason Isaac. Jason is the director of Life Powered, a national initiative of the Texas Public Policy Foundation to raise Americans' energy IQ. Great to have you on the show today, Jason. You know, I know you're the director of Life Powered, and can you tell our listeners a little bit about what, what your group does? Yeah, Life Powered is a national initiative of the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Our short mission statement is to raise America's energy IQ. The longer one is to make the connection between access to affordable, reliable energy and human flourishing. Uh, and so the Texas Public Policy Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit charitable organization, educational organization that has really three missions or, or three principles in its mission and its free markets, free enterprise individual liberty and personal responsibility. And that's what we're driven by. Uh, and so Life Powered is just one of the many initiatives that we work on. And we work to not only educate the general public, but primarily policymakers do extensive research uh, and then provide policymakers with ideas and solutions to, to really lower the cost of energy and promote human flourishing around the world. Wow, that sounds great. You know, I've been in the oil and gas business for going on, I guess, 30, 40 years. And, uh, you know, to me, I mean, it, you know, when I was growing up, I mean, you know, you just hit the light switch and the lights come on. And I think a lot of people around the country, you know, kind of don't know a lot about energy. And and so the work that your group is doing is sounds very, very well. And, you know, as far as that. So how do you go about, you know, basically uh, educating people on on energy and, you know, and the ins and outs of it? Well, sure. There's there's a couple of ways that we do that. We use different forms of media. It could be videos. Uh, it could be presentations. I can't tell you how many times I speak around the country uh, every year, but it, it is easily in the hundreds. Um, and, and so, and then we've got our policy you know, analysts and our team that go out and really educate the policy makers. Uh, we're working, doing stuff in the classroom. So I think that's really important that we reach the general public, that we make reach elected officials. And, and sometimes it's not even elected officials. It could be a, appointed officials, uh, bureau, bureaucrats, if you will, in the government, different levels of government. Uh, and then the, the, the general public, if I didn't mention that one already. But I think really important is, is kids. Uh, I, this is an issue we've been working on, I've been working on for almost a decade now, is just changing the education that our kids learn on a daily basis in public schools and they'll make curriculum available for private schools, make it available for home schools. Uh, and that is something that here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation and Life Powered has really taken off over the last couple of years, uh, just providing more curriculum. It was just amazing to me to see statistics and, and numbers that show that over 50% of the kids today suffer from eco-anxiety. And it's <laughs> a, a lot of the kids, they don't understand the products that we use in our daily, life, in our daily lives and, and where they come from, where they're made from. They just don't understand that you know, they, they say things like we, want, we have to ban fossil fuels now. And, you know, the first kid I, that tells me that and I say, well, let me have your cell phone. And they're like, no, I'm not giving that up. Well, of course you're not, because it's made from hydrocarbons and it makes your life easier, and more enjoyable. Uh, but they just don't understand that. And so we've, we've done a really good job and continue to do work on educating kids in the classroom with unbiased information about all forms of energy produced uh, in this country. Uh, there's there've been a couple of things that we've done you know, significantly within the Texas State Board of Education that will resonate around the country. We changed we worked with some other school districts to change some standards. Uh, and this is where 
uh, you know, if I, if I can digress for a second, when I, I served in the legislature last decade for four terms, I served eight years, I worked in economic, small business development, energy resources and environmental regulation. Those were my three primary inter- focuses when I was in the legislature. And I went on a, a trip, the economic development trip and went and visited with technology companies all up and down the, the West Coast. We were in Seattle, we were in Oregon, we were in, uh, you know, the, the, the there in, in near San Francisco with all the tech hubs. And we're visiting with these companies and they're telling us legislators that they're really suffering because kids aren't learning the computer programming skills and the computer engineering and, and com- just computer science skills. And, and they said, we're donating all this curriculum and we donate all of this technology to the school districts, but the utilization isn't very high. And I asked them, I said, well, does your curriculum align with, well, in Texas, what is the acronym is TEKS, T-E-K-S, Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. And I said, well, does your curriculum align with those? And that's the standards, the TEKS are the standards. Do you, does your curriculum align with TEKS? And everybody in the, the tech sector, every visit we went on, like, what are TEKS? And I'm like, <laughs> that's your problem. And so we've really focused on aligning our curriculum with the TEKS, and then we're able to work with some other school districts to get some of the TEKS changed, these standards. And I think two of the most beneficial standards that we got changed in public education was that kids will now have to learn about energy poverty, and really energy poverty is poverty. And they'll learn about things like what it means to not be in energy poverty, how much your life expectancy increases, basically positive outcomes from having access to affordable, reliable energy. And then they're going to have to do cost-benefit analysis for different types of energy sources. Uh, and this is something that the the left and the climate cult, as I fondly call them, just was absolutely up in arms about the fact that kids would have to consider cost benefit analysis when choosing different types of energy sources and reporting on different types of energy sources and why they would be so alarmed. I I don't know. Everybody says that wind and solar are cheaper, uh, but I think when you really get down to it, people are learning that that's not the case. Yeah. I saw one of your interviews, I think that you were, that you were doing and, you know, you were talking about, uh, just all of these, you know, politicians and, and, you know, and and of course you said you used to be in government. And so does the politicians actually believe that we can eliminate fossil fuels? No, I, I really, I don't think there's a single one that does, but I think that they're pandering to some of their, their donors and they're pandering to, to and there's a lot of people, a lot of politicians that'll just tell you what they, what they, they'll tell you what they think you want to hear. And it's it's really easy just to say that we're living in a catastrophic climate crisis and look at the storms because people have short term memory issues. Um, but when you really get down into the the science and the facts and the math, the, the actual facts are that the strength and severity of storms aren't increasing. Costs are certainly going up because people are building along coasts uh, where hurricanes tend to hit and they're building more expensive structures and those structures are getting damaged, not getting damaged as severe as they did 100 years ago. But there, there's just no way. And so, and I, and I think this is one of the areas we've done such a wonderful job over the last five decades. We've reduced pollution in this country nearly 80% over the last five decades. Hmm. The first time I told that to a energy staffer in the U.S. Senate, he laughed in my face. Wow. And he thought I was joking. And at that point in time, it was a 73% reduction. This is right at about five years ago. And now we're at nearly 80%, we're at 78% reduction. But he, he's like, that's funny, where'd, where'd you get your numbers from? Like, like this is polling. I'm like, no, there's actually air quality monitors. And I told him about my experience serving on the Environmental Regulation Committee and working with the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and knowing where all of our air quality monitors are and and that we have more in this country than in any other country in the world. Um, and, and talking about how we've actually improved things that in certain concentrations cause harm to human health. We've been world leaders at reducing pollution. And we're number one when it comes to access to clean and safe drinking water. And, and this is all because of economic prosperity. And you don't have economic prosperity without affordable, reliable energy. And that energy comes from fossil fuels, something. And, and I love it when people say, what are you going to do when you run out? And I'm like, well, we'll find another Texan and they'll find some more. Because as it stands right now, we've got at least a thousand year supply when you look at the hydrocarbons, oil, gas, and coal. Um, and that's not including nuclear. And we need a lot more nuclear as well. Yeah, no, I agree with you 100%. We need all forms of energy. I mean, we've got close to, what, 8 billion people in the world now and, you know, over 300 million people here in the United States. And, you know, when when you have 
good, solid, reliable, clean energy, like, you know, natural gas. I mean, that that's better for people, for developing nations too, right? I mean, as far as, I mean, everybody wants, you know, access to, to reliable energy. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And it's interesting because the Germans pay South Africa, I think it's $800 million a year not to build new coal-fired generation, which is just absolutely absurd. And then, you know, what does South Africa experience on a daily basis? This thing called load shedding. It happens between 3 and 7 p.m. They don't have enough reliable electricity, so people get their electricity disconnected. You, you can't survive very well in an environment like that where you're constantly having to worry about refrigeration. Think about medicines that need constant refrigeration or think about food that needs refrigeration. If you lose electricity for a couple of days, you're going to have a lot of food spoilage and that's just food waste. Uh, and that's not good. That's not good for economic prosperity. So really, you know, South Africa should be building more coal-fired generation. Uh, they need more natural gas because that's what would happen is that as they got wealthier, they would look for other forms that would be potentially cheaper, easier to implement. The pollution control technology on coal is expensive. Uh, it's not as expensive, nearly as expensive on natural gas. And that's something I've, I've joked about. I've testified four times in front of Congress. Uh, and I, I tell you know, the members of Congress that of all the technology the Chinese steal from us, it'd be nice if they would utilize our pollution control technology. <laughs> they, they don't. You go to these other countries and their, their emissions on their vehicles aren't what they are in the United States. They don't use pollution control technology like bag houses and scrubbers on concrete and asphalt and power generation facilities like we do here in the United States. We're capturing all of the things that, again, are in certain concentrations that are harmful to human health. And that's why we've become world leaders in clean air. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I love this. This whole EV push is just laughable because I was reading something yesterday you know, from the Sierra Club, a guy in Washington, D.C. saying, you know, this electric vehicle mandate in Washington, D.C. is going to clean the air. <laughs> um, and a AOC was just tweeting this week the same thing, like, hey, the administration's giving out uh, $69 million for electric school buses. Well, guess what doesn't work really well in cold weather? Electric cars, electric vehicles, electric school buses. And she's like, this is going to clean the air in New York. Well, I went and looked during COVID. During COVID, the first two months of the COVID lockdowns across this country, traffic was down 50%. We took 50% of the cars off the road. And the thing that we didn't see was any improvements in air quality. And wow, so if amazing. you went a hundred percent, like we wind up publishing a research paper on this um, and, and broke down several cities. And the reason uh, my motivation for having our team do this research paper was I heard an EV lobbyist say that we improved the air quality so much in Austin during the first two months of the COVID lockdowns because half the cars were off the road. That's why we need to go a hundred percent electric because it'll truly improve the air quality, you know, for everyone. And actually, during the in the city of Austin during the first two months of the COVID lockdowns, the air quality got worse. Wow! <laughs> it's just because we're, we're we're practically in a natural state in this country. Which wouldn't it be great if if other people around the world, you know, you mentioned the three hundred million plus million people live in the United States. Well, there's three and a half billion people around the world that don't have access to reliable electricity. They wow. they get as you know like a billion that have zero access. You talk about life transforming, you know, energy, it would just be absolutely incredible, lift the rest of the world out of poverty. And then they would get to experience clean air and clean water like we take for granted here in the United States. Well, I think a lot of people don't really realize that a lot of these EV cars, you know, that are being built out there. I mean, you know, you have to use fossil fuels to build them, right? You're not going to mine rare earth minerals <laughs> without using diesel and heavy equipment, are you? No, no, not at all. Mark Mills, who's just joining our team at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, has done extensive research on this and shows that for every electric vehicle battery, you know, this is basically your standard passenger car. Where I'm not talking about a Ford Lightning truck that's got several of these things in it. I'm talking about one passenger vehicle, one electric vehicle battery. You have to move 500,000 pounds of earth. Wow. And in some cases, you're doing that with hand tools, and it's un and unfortunately, kids are doing it. Just I just released uh, recently released a report that talks about 
all the kids that are involved in mining cobalt in Chinese owned and controlled mines in the Congo. And it's 40,000 kids, it's estimated, are working between the ages of four and 13 years old, which to me, like what about the 14, 15, 16, 17 year old? Those are also kids in my book, but it's 40,000 kids between the ages of four and 13 that are working in these Chinese owned and controlled mines. And some of them aren't even getting paid. Uh, it, it's child slave labor. And it's it's absolutely appalling that that's the case and that, that we're throwing billions of dollars towards something that, first of all, isn't necessary, doesn't do anything to improve the environment, doesn't do anything to mitigate changing climate. It just really pops up, the, props up the Chinese Communist Party, and you and I wind up paying a lot more for it. Well, that, that leads me to my next question. I mean, who is actually benefiting from <laughs> and determining who the winners and the losers are in this Green New Deal around the world? Yeah, and it's unfortunate because I, you know, I've... I've published some uh, research recently that shows the nonprofits that are foreign funded that are really directing these efforts, this energy transition. And I am, when people talk about the energy transition, especially if they're in the industry, I, I kind of lean in. It's like, great, you're talking about transitioning these last three and a half billion people out of energy poverty, you know, into prosperity by getting them access to things like propane. I mean, you, it would just be transformational for someone's life especially in Africa, people in South America still will walk around one hour a day to collect animal dung and wood to heat up water that they've spent hours a day walking to collect to make that water somewhat potable. And if you could get them a just a propane burner to improve the air quality and what the dwelling that they're living in uh, it would be just transformational. But you've got these groups that are heavily, heavily funded that are making contributions. A lot of them are former you know, administrative officials uh, that have either worked for the Obama or the Biden administration yeah. that are really forcing this this so-called energy transition down our throats. And, and what are we getting in return? You know, in Texas, electricity costs have gone up 25% over the last three years. That's Believe above me. inflation. And, and the reliability has gone down. Our reserve margins, this is something that we researched heavily and, and studied and warned about Winter Storm Uri before Winter Storm Uri happened. We knew we were going to have some outages. Uh, so it, it's just winter is the new norm. Winter is the new summer in Texas now, if you will. And really, I think the Northeast is experiencing that right now. Um, but it, it's just really unfortunate because it is it, it's the the Chinese Communist Party benefits significantly from this so-called energy transition, which really we need an energy expansion. We need to be producing more energy. You know, we produce energy in this country more responsibly than anywhere else on the planet. And we need to be exporting it around the world, getting people out from under you know, the control of Russia, China, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, you know, these dictators and these, these communist countries uh, that could care less about environmental protection, less about uh, human rights. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And I think that a lot of people are finally waking up to this EV push. I mean, because sales are down. A lot of these auto dealers can't get rid of these cars. I mean, what's the average car? Fifty thousand dollars, you know, it costs to to buy that car, and and uh, you know, what is the cost to operate it after you buy it? Yeah, and that's that's what's uh, really exciting because I was just I think I just did an interview here recently, and and someone was sharing some polling numbers about Gen Z. You know, these younger kids that they're having questions about this EV push and this climate, you know, so called climate agenda. Um, and, and I think they're finally starting to wake up and realizing that, wait a second, if we produce more energy here in this country, that's actually good for economic prosperity. We have clean air, we have clean water. These are wonderful things. Shouldn't yeah. we, shouldn't we have more of this? We, and I tell you, we, I think it was December. We just published some research on the true cost of electric vehicle. It's called overcharged expectations. If you want to search it up, you know, Ted Nugent even shared some stuff from our research, <laughs> which I think was a first. But we took a look at the cost and, and the numbers are going to increase significantly when we update them later this year. But we use numbers through 2021 that we had available and looked at 10 years cost of an EV. And you and I are heavily subsidizing the cost of every EV. And I'm not just talking about the $7,500 tax credit. You and I are paying higher costs for electric infrastructure. You know, there's reports that billions of dollars went into subsidized EVs had already been spent. I think it was to the tune of $7 billion 
had been spent to build EV chargers. And it wasn't until January that the first one in Cleveland, Ohio opened. So we've built one EV chargers with you and I handing out billions of tax dollars. Uh, but the, the cost that's, that you and I help pay, whether it's through this infrastructure, whether it's through these things called cafe credits, corporate average fuel economy credits. This is a, 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 an administrative state telling automakers that across their fleet, they have to maintain a certain mile per gallon. And that number increases you know, every few years, there's a significant increase. And so then they give them this crazy multiplier if they build an EV. And so rather than an EV, maybe saving you know one mile a gallon or for every mile per gallon, every gallon it saves, they get credit for saving nearly seven gallons. It's just some crazy arbitrary number. I've joked that, you know, Enron accountants and Bernie Madoff and Sam Bankman Freed would blush at the accounting gimmicks that the federal government is using in these handouts. Yeah. But so, and this is where Tesla would not have been profitable in 2021, 2022, sorry, had it not been for the sale of these credits. They make $1.78 billion in 2022 from selling these credits. That was where they were profitable because they get a ton of them. And so they sell them to the other automobile manufacturers so that they can you know, meet this corporate average fuel economy standard, which is just absolutely absurd because they're not meeting it. They're just buying credits and increasing the cost of the car. That adds nearly $20,000 in subsidies for every EV that is spread out to every single gasoline or diesel car or truck sold in the United States. And you and I are the ones that are bearing the burden of those costs because you know, we're going to go out and buy a gas vehicle or a diesel vehicle. Um, it, it's just massive. So these electric vehicles cost $50,000, throw in another nearly $50,000 in subsidies from you and I, um, and then you've got Ford that's losing $62,000 for every Lightning that's sold. And those don't cost $50,000. Those cost ninety two. So it's, I mean, the true cost is over $200,000 for these things. And I think people are waking up to the realization, and with the exception of Tesla, it's uh, oh, the number is now over 50% for people that have bought an EV and then they go and it, it life's out three to four or five years. They're going to buy another car and replace the EV. Over 50% of those buyers are going back to gas or diesel vehicles. And that, that's true for every automobile manufacturer except for Tesla. There's a big brand loyalty for people with Teslas. So, and also, I think that a lot of people don't really realize the weight of these cars. You know, I mean, how how does that uh, damage the roads? I mean, when you, you know, if you sell all these EVs that you say you're going to sell, I mean, you're going to increase the weight on a lot of our roads and bridges. I mean, you know, that seems to be the big, big issue every time we have an election is that we're going to give money to roads and bridges. I mean, we're going to continue doing that, right? <laughs> yeah, and I'm I'm going to try this year to work on convening some research to be done to show the incremental cost that that's going to have on our roads, our bridges, because it is thousands of pounds more weight. Yeah. You look at the garages that were designed today, parking garages and, and parking structures that were designed that are designed to be that are built today. They were not meant to carry massive several thousand pound vehicles. They were meant to carry internal combustion engines, you know, cars, gasoline and diesel cars. But these batteries add significant weight to the vehicles, which is frightening when you think about it. There are already cities in this country that will start to ban uh, charging stations in parking structures. And I think you're going to see them start to move against EVs being parked in parking garages unless they meet some new stringent requirement. Uh, wow. the, the the charging station ban, you're going to see it in more and more cities popping up uh, because of fire hazard. And it's just something that they can't, you, you don't put them out. You, yeah, just, I, I, yeah. you, you can't put them out. You let it burn, but you dump thousands of gallons, 25 to 35,000 gallons of water on it to keep it contained. And it is just an environmental disaster. You think about all the toxic materials that are burning out, all that pollution that's going into the air. Uh, it, it's just absolutely awful. And to think that we're we're pushing these electric school buses on kids, these things go up quick. 
Uh, I did a segment with Jesse Waters a couple months ago about this, and it's just, it's frightening. I wouldn't want my kids getting on an electric bus. Uh, you know, if I get on some electric transport bus, you know, because I'm taking public transportation in some of the cities I travel to, I'm going to sit really close to a door and make yeah. sure I know how to get out <laughs> as quick as possible. Yeah, I think I saw something in the paper not too long ago. One of these cars caught on fire, and like you said, they couldn't put it out. Yep. I mean, it's just sitting there burning, you know, with all this, you know, at a very high, intense rate. Yeah, and that's what happened during, like, uh, during the floor. I really thought DeSantis would come out and ban the sale of EVs in the state of Florida after a hurricane because you had these cars that were submerged in, in salt water. And then when they, they no, no longer submerged, they were catching on fire. And not only were they burning the house down that was because the car was parked in a garage, not only were they burning that house down, their other houses were impacted. Wow. So I, <laughs> it, it's just we're just moving down this road towards inefficiency. Uh, and as the Toyota chairman says, he could build so many more hybrid electrics than he could electrics. I think he can make 90 hybrid electrics with the same amount of components that go into one electric vehicle and would have a better improvement on fuel economy, better improvement on emissions and pollution reduction. But you know, when, when the left won't embrace nuclear, it's very clear that this is not about reducing emissions or reducing pollution. It's about control. I always thought the hybrids were... Or was the best, you know, alternative, you know, if you're going to have a, an alternative to fossil fuels is to have a, have a hybrid, hybrid car that, that basically runs on fossil fuels. Like if you go on a trip, but it's also capable of charging itself. So when you get to a city, you can flip over to electric and you can drive around, you know, town. And like you said, you save money or, you know, as far as on that, but. No, uh, you're, you're so right, Mike. But the thing is the hybrids, even though they're more fuel efficient, last longer, have better repair records than electric vehicles. They don't get that multiplier credit, that 6.67 cafe multiplier credit that electric vehicles get. Wow. And it, you look at what Dodge Ram has done. They've just built a pickup truck. It's They call it an electric pickup truck, but it's got a natural gas generator huh. in the truck to charge the battery so they can get longer range. You would think, well, that's a natural gas, like hybrid pickup truck. Yeah. Nope, it's classified as an electric vehicle. So they get that crazy multiplier credit that just distorts the market. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, I read another article on your website that talked about green garbage. And I thought that was pretty interesting because, you know, being in the oil and gas business, of course, you know, you see a lot of times people to abandon their wells and just leave them there. But that's a pretty small footprint. Yeah. But when you look at one of these blades that come off of a windmill, you know, I mean, that that thing's like a hundred foot long, isn't it? I mean, what kind of landfill does it take to fill that stuff up? <laughs> yeah, they're massive. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of them out in Sweetwater, Texas. It's really not hard to find. I drive by them every time I go up to Lubbock or, uh, but out in Sweetwater, Texas, out in West Texas, they're just piling up there. There's been a lot of media on this recently that they've become, you know, breeding grounds for snakes and varmints and, you know, mosquitoes. Uh, and I love it. They've replaced the sign a couple of times now that says for future recycling. You know, I, I've got pictures of it about 10 years ago and then that sign's completely tattered. Then they put up a metal one, <laughs> you know, it still says for future recycling. Yeah. The only thing that the sign's not even getting recycled. Um, it, it's just an environmental disaster. I, I, I think I said one time that it's like the left wants to destroy the earth to save the planet. And that's what we're seeing with these. I saw a solar installation up in the north that got destroyed by hail, hundreds of acres of solar that they're taking you know, good farmland off and putting in solar. And they wouldn't be doing it if it weren't for the subsidies. And this is the area where we've reported on extensively. And people like to say, oh, fossil fuels get subsidies too. And I, and I say, yeah, let's end them all. And guess what's still going to exist the day after you end them all? Fossil fuels will. Hydrocarbons, natural gas, oil, coal, nuclear, those things will survive. What won't survive is this unreliable variable generation. It does not exist. And that's why they've, these companies that have invested in wind and coastal wind have been going to the governor of New York and saying, we actually need higher rates. We need more money. They're getting billions of dollars in subsidies that you and I are paying. And all we're getting is less reliable electricity for a more expensive cost. And the environmental, the environmental destruction is just terrible from the toxic materials and solar panels, from the toxic materials that are in wind blades, as you mentioned. And the only way to get more subsidies 
Every 10 years, if you make a significant investment, so what do they do? They replace the blades, even though they may not be near their end of life, but it extends the production tax credit for another 10 years. Wow. They figured, and it's a lot of foreign companies that are investing in doing this because they figured out how to game the system. So it's it's really frustrating to me that we're subsidizing socialism in France with EDF, Electric Day France, and we're subsidizing communism in China because most of the technology, if not yeah, all, I, is not I, possible without China. I agree with you. I, uh, <clears throat> I see a lot of these offshore wind companies are international companies. I mean, I thought the Green New Deal was supposed to, you know, be for American companies to develop this green energy, but it seems the majority of them are are international, and they're and they're just getting our tax dollars. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. It's it's <laughs> it's uh, you hate to see it, but this is what government does. Yeah. You know. No, I agree with you. Well, Jason, it was great having you on the show today, and I'd love to have you back in the future, man. This has been an interesting topic. Yeah, we've got some exciting developments, you know, with with Life Powered and our education efforts. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that I was the director. Actually, last month, I, I, I'm no longer the director. I'm a senior fellow with Life Powered. Oh, okay. uh, because one thing that we've been incubating over the last year and a half, two years, is some frustration from energy producers in this country. And so, you know, I've, I've stepped aside, I guess, as a full-time employee of the foundation, although very heavily involved and actually a donor. Um, but we're building a, a new American Energy Association to support and you know promote American energy. Again, it's more you know more, more responsibly produced than anywhere on the planet. But it'll be oil, gas, coal, nuclear. We've got to promote free markets with an American energy. And so we're building a new trade organization. I say we're, we're incubated it here at the foundation and now it'll be a separate entity with a separate board and separate, you know, supporters, but it's just something that a lot of independents, whether they produce oil and gas or coal or nuclear companies said, you know, we, we just don't feel like we have true representation in Washington, DC and around the States that haven't kind of capitulated on certain things. We need free markets first and foremost, and we need to produce American energy. So I'm excited. I'd love to come back on and talk to you about that maybe a few months down the road. That would be fantastic. And uh, do y'all have a website that our people can go to? Yeah, we do. AmericanEnergyInstitute.com is the website for the 501c3, which is the educational arm of the American Energy Association, which is getting built right now. But AmericanEnergyInstitute.com. Keep up the great work. Hey, thanks, Mike. So much. Appreciate you. And for those that want to learn about the Texas Public Policy Foundation, texaspolicy.com or lifepowered.org. You've been listening to The Energy Show with REI Energy. Energize your investments and maximize your tax deductions. To learn more, go to reienergy.com.